Now, I'd like to just share a few thoughts with you quickly about the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is the earthly throne of God. The reason that God told Moses to build a sanctuary was for the purpose that God could dwell among his people. So he, he made the statement he, to Moses, he says, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. So that was the entire purpose, and of course the Ark of the Covenant in that sanctuary was a copy of the heavenly throne of God. We need to have that firmly fixed in our mind because it becomes important uh, when we're considering what's about to happen next. Now, the Bible in the Old Testament predicts everything of importance. Okay? Amos 3 7, surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveal his secrets through his servants, the prophets. The most important thing that has ever happened on this earth, the heart and soul of the plan of salvation, is the fact that Christ died that we might have eternal life, that we might be rescued from a sentence of certain death. And the proof of that is his blood on the earthly throne of God. So we can expect that that would be predicted in the Old Testament, can't we? All right, of course, the Bible tells us that all of the blood sacrifice system was types and shadows leading us to Christ. So they are prophetic uh, activities that everyone that participated in were supposed to know what they meant. But like many people today, the Bible talks about <coughs> having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof or being totally unfamiliar with what it all has to do about. And I'm sure there were people that participated in, in these blood sacrifices that lost sight of what they meant. But anyway, there is a specific prophecy and that's found in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. That little verse spans a great deal of time. <clears throat> 490 years. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Two. And it goes ahead and basically says that at the end of that time, everything basically will have been accomplished. An end was to be made to sin. The sacrifice and oblation was to be made to cease. And it says to anoint the most holy. All right? Now, we know what anointing is has to do with some kind of oil and usually some sort of perfume in it. And it was used to anoint people for different purposes, primarily to a certain office, like the office of a prophet or the, office, uh, the uh, anointed to be king over Israel. As a matter of fact, Elijah anointed Hazelil or somebody to be king of Assyria and he wept when he anointed him because he knew that what horrible things he was going to do to the Israelites. So anyway, the most holy was to be anointed. Now, I haven't heard many sermons on this subject. And those that I have heard, uh, it was indicated that this had something to do with the baptism of Christ and his anointing by the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. Right? 
The Bible does say that he was to be anointed with the joy of gladness more than his fellows. And uh, the dove, or the Holy Spirit, did descend upon him at the occasion of his baptism in the form of a dove. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> that's one point in the Bible where it records the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit all in the same time, place at the same time for those who, you know, resist the idea that there are three that make up the Godhead. But Christ is one of three most holy. He's not the most holy, if you see what I'm saying. Now, the Bible refers to the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant as being the most holy. And the reason the most holy place was called that was because this mercy seat was there. It means the place of the most holy are the most holy place. And so anyway, what it is saying is that the blood of Jesus would be placed upon the mercy seat at the end of those 70 weeks or near the end of those 70 weeks. Now next, <clears throat> we find in the New Testament where these prophecies have been fulfilled. Are there statements in the New Testament that tell us the blood of Jesus actually went on the mercy seat? And the answer to that is yes. And I have that printed out in these handouts. So if you haven't got one for your family, and please just take one per family. Some of you already have them, but before you go, get one of these, <clears throat> because it has these verses, but I'll share them with you quickly. 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. Verse 6 says, speaking of Christ, it says, who came by water and by blood, not by water only, but by water and by blood. It's important and it's stated in a manner that we are to understand it clearly. That Christ came by water and by blood. And then it makes us aware in verse 7 that there are three that keep a record of everything that goes on on planet Earth says there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, it's that verse that some people, well, it was scratched off of the Textus Receptus, but it was found relocated again on an older manuscript that was in the care and keeping of the Waldensian Christians. So it's, you know, it's not as some people would like us to believe something that was just stuck in the Bible for no good reason. But anyway, when somebody tells you that, the, that there's only one God, you know, there's not three that make up the Godhead, and there are, there is one God in purpose, intent, power, and all of these things. But there are three separate beings. And if you need a scripture to share that idea with people, uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 17, where he prays to his Father that his disciples, says, make them one, even as you and I are one. Okay? Now, God does not intend for us just to become one big blob of flesh down here. You know, we're separate individuals. But we can become one as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one because our purposes are the same. And that is to show God some gratitude for what He's done for us and cooperate with Him in the saving of lost souls. So anyway, this is where we get the information that there is a record kept in heaven of all the things that take place here. 
and we will meet that record in the day of judgment if we have not gone to the Father in the name and blood of the Son now and any time that we make mistakes and ask that those sins be blotted out in the name and blood of Jesus. In that case, our sins will have gone before us to judgment, the Bible says, and our names will be in the book of life. If we have any sins in that record that have not been forgiven and blotted out, then our names will be removed from the pages of the book of life. So we want to make sure that there's no unforgiven sins. And uh, we need to, if there are some sins, some things we have done, we need to do all that we can to make wrongs right before we ask God for forgiveness. Now, when I was a kid, I stole a candy bar. I stole a, a weight that goes on a fishing line. And I'm a chicken. So rather than go in and fess up and all of that, I went in and bought one of each and then went back and put them on the shelf and left. Uh, that's the coward's way, but I believe that God understands and the person got reimbursed for what I had stolen. But anyway, now the next verse is quite important. It says there are three that bear witness in earth the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. All right, we know what the Holy Spirit is. Now the water and the blood is the dried serum and the dried platelets of the blood of Son of God on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant in the earth. There are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are one. Now, if a person shares this concept with people in a careless, non-caring <coughs> manner, it's worthless. It's of no value. In fact, it can do damage. But if it is presented to someone through the power and persuasiveness of the Holy Spirit that Christ shed His blood for us, then this is explained in verse 9 of that chapter. It says, if you believe man, or the witness of man, the witness of God is greater. And this, referring back to this water and the blood through the power of the Holy Spirit, is God's witness and testimony of His Son. Now, we've all seen trials and everything, and we're about to see another one, I guess, in the Senate. A witness is somebody that has information or claims to have information. And what they say becomes testimony. That is their testimony. In a trial, it becomes evidence or proof. Okay? So what this verse is saying to us when we translate it into present day English is that God the Father is the witness and his proof to us that his son died for us is the dried blood and serum of his son on the mercy seat of the ark of the covenant now there's another verse and that's in first timothy chapter 2 verse 5 and 6 it says there is one god and one mediator between god and man the man christ jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. In other words, the proof will be given in due time. Now, there's some verses, scriptures that help us understand what is being talked about here when it says due time. In Ephesians, <clears throat> It says, in the dispensation of fullness says, of times, God subdued all things unto himself in Christ Jesus. And then in Matthew it says, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son. So God has everything on a time schedule, friends. 
and when the time is right, when the fullness of the time has come, then the tables of stone that God wrote his law upon to, and the same law that he spoke from the mountaintop amid smoke and fire and earthquakes and all of that, will be presented once again to this world and everyone will be allowed to see it, especially everyone that is interested in what's right and what's wrong in doing the will of God. At that time, the blood of Christ on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant will be shown to the world. That will be shown on video. Tables of stone you'll be able to see for yourself if you would wish. Now there's another scripture and this is in Revelation chapter 11 verse 19. In the book of Revelation John says I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Mark 2, chapter 2, verse 27 and 28, the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath day. Exodus 20, I forget the verse, but it says, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Right? So when John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, he was in the Spirit on the Sabbath. Now, as you read through the book of Revelation, you'll find that 31 times John made the statement, I saw. And the things he saw took place around the throne of God in the temple of God in heaven. He saw the Lamb as though it were slain, open the seven seals. He said, I saw the four beasts around the throne of God. I saw the four and twenty elders around the throne of God. I saw the seven angels holding the seven vials containing the seven last plagues. Thirty-one times he said, I saw. And then in this chapter and in this verse he says something. He says, the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his testament was seen he didn't say I saw he says was seen in his temple the ark of his testament dear friends is his earthly throne the one that the blood of his son is upon because that is his testament the ark of his testament was seen in his temple well, the ark with his testament, which is stated in 1 John 5, 8 and 9, is the one that has the blood of his son upon it. That is his proof to this world that his son died on our behalf. And it says it was seen in his temple. Now you'll get to see this on video. But the chamber where I found the Ark of the Covenant has since been perfectly cleaned out. And the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, the candlestick, the golden altar of incense, they are all set out as they were in the earthly temple except that the Ark of the Covenant is set, setting against the 12 foot long and 18 foot wide or high wall and that wall is a beautiful crystal radiating the colors of the rainbow it's a permanent arrangement folks it's something that the hundred and forty four thousand will get to see for themselves so anyway God's temple his earthly temple is this chamber. And that's sad. His people began to worship the temple, to worship the Ark of the Covenant, to worship everything but the God of that temple, whose throne the Ark of the Covenant was. So he had to move his most holy place into the earth 
in this cave chamber in Ezekiel and what you probably will want to do is begin to read at chapter 40 and read on for a ways but it talks about the priests and the Levites it says they will no more come near my most holy my holy things in the most holy place because they have polluted themselves among the heathen said but they shall offer the blood and the fat at my table and in there it describes this table this altar that was to be built its dimensions and all of that and said this shall be called the table of the Lord that was what was in the second temple the Ark of the Covenant was never in the second temple and on Titus's arch in Rome that altar is shown being carried into the city of Rome along with the candlesticks now in Ezra it makes the statement that many of the priests and the ancient men who had seen the former house wept when they saw the foundation of the next temple that was to be built well those priests that came back from the captivity they had been in the former temple they had seen it they had served in there they knew what the table of showbread looked like they knew what the golden altar of incense looked like and they knew what the candlesticks looked like they made copies replicas and those were in the second temple but there was no one there that knew what the ark of the covenant looked like the high priest had died so anyway God moved his earthly throne into this chamber and hid it from the eyes of man for many many years since 586 BC until the present time until 1982 when he allowed me to find it but it was all covered up until he was ready for it to be revealed so the ark of his testament will be shown to the entire world in his temple in his earthly temple the blood of his son on the mercy seat of the ark of the covenant now the mechanics of that how it happened is in matthew chapter 27 verses 52 50 through 53 it says when he had cried again he died the earth shook the rocks were rent well it says the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom then the earth shook and the rocks were rent and the graves were opened when the rocks rent the cliff behind where Christ was being crucified split all the way down right past the left side of the cross hole and down into the chamber where God had hidden the Ark of the Covenant some 600 years before. And when the centurion pierced Christ's spleen and probably the left ventricle of the heart, depending on how deep the thrust went, the blood and the, the platelets and serum gushed out and went down through that crack onto the Ark of the Covenant 20 feet below and fulfilled ratified if you please the old and the new covenant and at that moment you and I were bought with a price as was everyone else on this planet if they will only take advantage of what was done for them what Christ did was enough to redeem every man, woman, and child that has ever been born on planet Earth. Yeah. The tragedy is that so few avail themselves of that wonderful gift. Now, the next morning, and this is in Matthew chapter 28, it says, the angel descended to roll back the stone and there was a great earthquake. 
I believe that God closed the crack at that point in time because there's no evidence of any surface water, rain, or dirt, dust, anything else having fallen through that crack other than just the blood of Jesus. And there it remained for over 2,000 years. Well, for almost 2,000 years. But the ark was sitting there 600 years before the blood actually went on there. that we share with you today. God shares with you today because He wants you to know what He has done on behalf of all of us. And He is now preparing a people to give that last message soon. There will be more terrible things happen on this earth than are happening now. And people will say, hey, the reason all this is happening is because we're not serving God. And they will say, as the Pope said in 1995, we need a set of laws, religious laws, that everyone has to keep in order that these terrible things end. Now there's a story, I think it's in 2 Kings. It talks about the people that were brought out of different countries in the Babylonian kingdom, a kingdom, I'm sorry, the Assyrian kingdom, and were placed in the cities of Samaria to live there. And it says that God sent lions among them and killed a bunch of them. And so they said, went to their leaders and said, look, we've got to do something uh, to, keep, you know, to stop these lions from coming in and killing all of us, or a lot of us. And they were told, well, the God of this area has to be worshipped in a certain manner. So you have to fear the God of this area. And so it makes the statement, it says, they feared God and made their children pass through the fire to Molech. It doesn't say Molech, but it gives a name which is the same as Molech uh, by a different name. You know, a rose by any other name is still a rose. Molech by any other name is still Molech. And it said, and they feared the God, feared God and made of the vilest among them priests and all of this sort of thing. And so, anyway, it doesn't say that the lions bothered them anymore. And uh, I don't really understand what's going on here, but I guess they at least acknowledged the sovereignty of the God of that area, the God of the Jews. And as they recognized his sovereignty with sending the lions in among them, but people on this earth are going to say, we need to serve God so that he will quit sending all these pestilences, wars, and whatever among us. Now these people, because they have not accepted the blood of Jesus, which is God the Father's proof that his son died for us, they reject all of this, they reject his law the penalty of which we are rescued from by the blood of Christ. Not so that we can keep sinning. Paul asked that very question. He said, shall I continue in sin that grace might much more abound? And he said, God forbid. And then in Hebrews 10, 26 and onward, it says, if we sin willfully after we come to a knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice. So those who would tell you that you give your heart to the Lord and your wallet to them and then do whatever you want to with what's left are deceivers. We cannot do that. We are to present our bodies a living sacrifice to the one who died on our behalf and has redeemed us. And folks, we're not giving him much. That's right. But he can make 
he can turn it into a son and daughter of God that perfectly reflect his character and he will do that okay so anyway those are the comments that I wanted to share with you there's many other people have looked for it and are continuing to look for it and of course they won't find it and Satan has raised up many stories that the Ark of the Covenants in Ethiopia in a cave chamber on the Mount Ebal <coughs> under the Temple Mount he wants us to believe that it's anywhere else besides under where Christ died and that his blood went on it. Okay. There are three heavens. There's the atmospheric heaven. That's the one the birds fly in. Okay. There's the starry heavens. That's where the sun, moon, stars, and all of that are located. Then there's the third heaven. And that's where the throne of God is. Uh, Paul said that he knew a man who was caught up to the third heaven. All right. All right. In the Bible, in Revelation chapter 14, I think verse 6, somewhere in there, it says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. Okay and saying, Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come and worship Him who made the heavens and the earth, the seas and the fountains of water. Where was that message given? All over the world. See, all of these things are for the benefit of this planet and its inhabitants. The angel was flying in the midst of heaven, but the gospel was for this earth. All right? When the temple of God is opened in heaven, it simply means that God reveals to the inhabitants of this earth what is going on in heaven. And then he says the ark of his testament was seen. Once again, John was in the heavenly temple, throne room of God, 31 times. He said, I saw all of the different things. But here he said, was seen in his temple well he had a temple in the wilderness or a sanctuary Solomon built a temple where God dwelt the Shekinah glory left Solomon's temple that's recorded in the 10th chapter of Ezekiel but his earthly throne was moved into a cave chamber which then became the most holy place and the earthly throne room or temple of God. And it's that temple that the ark of his testament is in because his testament to this world that his son died for us is the blood of Jesus on the mercy seat of this earthly throne. And so he says, was seen in his temple. Now, some of you, if you have that, might want to read it. It says, after that, it said, there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and a great earthquake and great hail. Those are, that is a description of the plagues. But this is my understanding of what it is talking about. And to me, it's saying as soon as the world, the inhabitants of the world, have seen this, then probation is closed and the plagues fall because there's nothing else God can do for the inhabitants of this earth after he has done that and he has made them all aware that he has done that. In fact, the Bible says, what more could I have done in my vineyard that I have not done? And so that's my understanding of this. And I believe that God would not let me find these things and then, you know, uh, hide what his intentions were. Okay, so when this is presented to the world, and you and I will all have an opportunity to share this with people. When this is brought out, when the tables of stone are brought out and this video is shown, there'll be people wanting to know what all this means. I won't be able to talk to them, but you will in your neighborhood. Do you have plenty of copies of it? When, when 
Well, there will be plenty of copies of it, and you have my permission to copy it off of the TV when it's shown. But again, I will have copies of all of this in the hands of people I can trust around the world to be released at the proper time. Okay. But anyway, that's why we're here today. It's not an accident, folks. God is preparing a people to finish his last work. And you're that people. Okay, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. My question is, are you going by sight that you think it was the actual blood? I mean, that it was blood? Or was there testing done to make sure that this was blood? We tested it to make sure it was blood. Yes, ma'am. And it's unique blood. When we share, well, I'll quickly state this. I know there's some doctors here and nurses and uh, some anesthetists, people that are familiar with blood. All of us have 46 chromosomes unless we have Down's syndrome. Okay? Christ had 24. Each parent supplies 23 chromosomes to a new infant. All right, Christ got 23 from his mother. He got one from his father. There was a Y, which determined that made him a male. He got it from, not from an earthly father, or he would have had 46 like the rest of us. Okay? So anyway, when this is shown, nobody will be able to honestly doubt that this is indeed the blood of God's Son. Amen. And that's why he says this is his testimony of his Son. It's his proof to this world. Yes? Pardon? White blood cells. And you're saying how can you test a dead white blood cell for chromosome count? Right. His blood is not dead. If that helps you any. Right. When put in a growth medium, they divide it. We reconstituted them, put them in a growth medium, and they divided. If that doesn't blow your socks off, I don't know what will. <laughs> yes? Do you have this uh, second video about that uh, available now? Or? Well, I will share it with people who I can trust when I am told by the angel that one of the angels that's guarding the Ark of the Covenant when to release it and who to, okay? Because I can't tell. You know, people can fool me. I'm not that clever. Yes, you want to read something? Okay. Leviticus 17.11 for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you. What was that text again? Leviticus 17, Leviticus 17, 11. That makes it extremely clear, folks. There's a lot of texts that have new meaning since these things since I found this okay any other questions yes ma'am are you saying that you were able to take a video camera in there and video is that what I'm is that what you're saying and well I didn't say that but there is video available of all of this and it will be shown when I'm told to do so. What do, you, what do you mean by this? Well, I'm talking about the Ark of the Covenant, my removing the tables of stone out of it, Christ's blood on and, and the blood, and me taking the sample, the analysis. I didn't do this. I took it to a place in Israel where they do this kind of thing. And they thought I was crazy when I asked them to do it. A chromosome count. Now I've heard that you 
but yeah. they went crazy after they saw the results. Sure. I have heard that. Um, you know, I have not heard you say this, but I have heard that you said this that the angel took the tables of stone out of the ark and let. No. You that is not true, then. No, I, this is something that has amazed me. I can talk to a whole audience, and I think we have a perfect understanding of what I have said, and then somebody will quote me as having said that. I never said that. I said the angel told me to take the table of stone, tables of stone out of the Ark of the Covenant, and the four of them took hold of the corners of the mercy seat and lifted it so that I could get to the tables of stone in the Ark of the Covenant. I took them out, backed away. They set the uh, mercy seat back down on the Ark of the Covenant and I just stood there and the angel came and took the tables of stone and put them on a stone shelf in the chamber. And that's where they are at this point in time. That's also where the video is. They're out of the Ark of the Covenant, but they're not out of the chamber, unless the angels did something with them after I left. See, they're not obliged to tell me everything they do. After all, they're God's angels. Yes? Pardon? Four. Yes. The tables of stone are not broken. Oh, you're talking four stones? There's two tables of stone, okay? With four sides written on all four sides. Four angels also. Four angels that are, you know, said, the one that talked to me said that they had guarded the Ark of the Covenant and its contents since Moses put them in there. All right. Now, whether that requires them to be there every minute or not, I don't know. I would assume that one angel could, you know, take care of things and the others could be doing other things at the same time so I don't have the computer power to understand what angels can do and can do yes well it's it's in proto Aramaic if that means anything to you it's a, it's a script that all Philologists can read easily. And it's written, it doesn't have vowels or punctuation. You know, the Bible in one place, place talks about God's ten words. Well, all of these things are, you know, jammed together until the, the commandment is finished. And, and then, of course, it stops. So there's no punctuation, no vowels. Written in what, in there. what language? Proto-Aramaic. And you can look that up in books that discuss philology, sir. What keeps the uh, Israeli government from going into this site? And, uh, the six uh, Israelis that died in the attempt to go in and move it. Were you out? Yes, he was out. You were out. Okay. Anyway, it was decided to move it out of occupied territory into unquestioned Israeli territory, which seems like a noble project. But the men that went in to move it died before they even got near the chamber. So as far as I know, there hasn't been any more attempts. Yes. They were right. They were dressed in Levitical type clothing. You know, as described in, in uh, Leviticus, Exodus, Leviticus, and all of that. The stone, what type of material is it? Is it like granite, or, is, or can you identify The it? stone that the tables are written on. Yeah. Well, <coughs> I don't want there to be any confusion about these because people will see them. Uh -huh. All right? Yeah. And uh, I'm not a geologist. And... We have not tested the tables. Well, they originally said, I mean, they, people say the original tables that Moses broke were sapphire stone. I have no knowledge of whether they were or not, except that God told Moses, make a, another set of tables the new set was probably not like unto the first. 
I would assume that if the first were sapphire, the second would have been, and they're not. Okay. Now, the reason I don't describe the tables of stone is this. If something is described to us that we've never seen, our mind makes a comparison with something we have seen. And this is an automatic. It's not something we do for meanness or for goodness. Either one, it just happens. And then after a certain amount of time has passed, we forget that this was a comparison. And so somebody one day will say, Ron Wyatt told me that the tables of stone looked like my Aunt Martha scrub board. <laughs> because you see, that's what they've compared my description to. And so for that reason, I'm not describing anything more than I have here because you'll get to see them. If you wouldn't get to see them, then, you know, I'd have to try to draw it or do something so you could understand about it. Okay, there's a question back here. Yeah, angels do appear on video and pictures. And I don't believe in vampires, so. Was, was other excavation, this, this chamber you found wasn't originally connected to this other tunnel, was it? Was yes. Uh, I don't know if it was something, see, God knows all these things from day one. So he may have had this all set up, ready to go. I don't know, sir. God is leaving us without excuse, and he's giving you part of a witness to all of us to how soon he is coming. Amen. Yeah, today is the day of salvation. Thank you, brother. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And amen. Amen. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Well, is it your thought that no one other than yourself may be allowed? then to go in to retrieve the video and other things. There's some things I can't handle thinking about. This is one of them. Now there's no reason under the sun that I'm aware of that God should allow me that honor and nobody else. But to my knowledge, no one else has been in there and seen them. There are people that go around the country and say that they went into the chamber with me and saw all of this. Well, bless their hearts, I guess they think they're doing me a favor. But, you know, lying lips are an abomination to God. And if people ask me if so-and-so went into the chamber with me, I have to say, you know, I was unaware that anybody was there with me. I, that's the gentlest way I can answer the question. Yeah. Well, my sons helped until they both came down with pneumonia to the point that they had to go home. They were running temperatures of 103 uh, and uh, upwards, uh, and I sent them home because, you know, they were in poor health. I was running that temperature too, but I decided that it, I was going to die in the hole if I didn't find the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> You'd have had to have been there. It was not a. It was a stressful situation. Yes, ma'am. Now, if you have to go, go ahead. Don't won't hurt our feelings. God bless you and thanks for the beautiful music. Okay. Yeah. You too. Well, it's burned in, uh, and I said I wouldn't do any more describing, but I will do this. If you can picture a tray of butter and someone with a perfect handwrite and they write it in there and then it turns to stone and the letters become etched as with fire. In other words, melted into the stone. Then you can understand it. Otherwise, that's just, you know, the best I can do on the description. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, Let's bow our heads. I'll say a prayer. And then there will be another announcement or two afterwards. Dear Heavenly Father,
We thank you again for all that you've done for us. We apologize for our poor faltering efforts to serve you. We ask that you'll please forgive us, cleanse us, restore us to your likeness, fill us with your Holy Spirit, strengthen us, do whatever's necessary in our lives to make us useful in this last message to this world. We ask that you'll please not let anyone be lost, that you can use us in any way to help them come to you and be saved. In Jesus' name and by his blood we pray. Amen.